Welcome to another episode of Steeler Thoughts and Chief Feelings Film Review. This episode will be a review of the Steelers' Week 3 victory against the LA Chargers, a 20-10 win in Pittsburgh. Thanks to all of you who've been watching, who've been commenting. Uh, We've had a lot of people following along on our YouTube channel. Also on social media, we're at STCF715 on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. We try to get some posts up almost every day. Uh, We're particularly, we tend to be active on Twitter on game days, especially right after the Chiefs and Steelers games. We try to post a little bit of some clips and some thoughts about how each game went. So we appreciate you following along there. The Steeler Thoughts Chief Feelings podcast, uh, typically we record those on Mondays. They will be on the YouTube channel and they will be available wherever you download podcasts. Chris and I tend to recap the week, both from Chiefs and Steelers perspective and from an overall NFL perspective. And then we look ahead to the Chiefs and Steelers games for the next week. Uh, We appreciate those of you who follow along that way as well. Well, let's get to this game. We've got several plays to look at. Uh, Starting with this play here on the fifth drive of the game, the Chargers are facing a second and seven at the Steelers. Looks like about 27 yard line. So I guess it must be more than second and seven because the first down marker is over here. So let's call it second and nine at about the 27 yard line or so. And the Chargers, the game right now is 0-0. The first four drives all ended in quick punts. And the Chargers come out here in 11 personnel. So they've got the one running back and they've got one tight end. They've got a bunch over here. And what they end up doing in the bunch is they've got a flat route, they've got a curl route, and they've got a go. And the Steelers, uh, this was kind of a big question. So those of you that saw this play live, this ends up with, uh, we can run it real quick, it ends up with a a touchdown to Quentin Johnson up top here down the sideline. He's got a huge hole right here, wide open for a touchdown. And so the question that Chris and I had when we were watching this live was what coverage are the Steelers running here? Like what what's going on? And after watching this play, it looks pretty certain to me that the Steelers are running a typical cover two. And uh, the only kind of variation on it is that instead of just rushing these four, the Steelers actually drop TJ Watt in zone coverage and they blitz Beanie Bishop here. But it still ends up, it's a simulated pressure. They're still rushing four and playing cover two. They disguise it though, because at the snap, it looks more like cover one, right? It looks here like Minka Fitzpatrick is playing single high safety, but what they end up doing at the snap, it looks like Minka is supposed to cover this half and Deshaun Elliott drops back and it looks like he is supposed to cover the other half. So, and Peyton Wilson is coming up and playing like the middle linebacker role in the Tampa. So it looks like this is supposed to be Tampa two. Now, the one question we could ask, and I don't know that we'll have a good answer, is are, were the corners playing cloud coverage or were they responsible for the flat? Was And really, with respect to Joey Porter Jr., is he playing cloud or is he supposed to come down to the flat? It's kind of hard to tell from this play because what ends up happening is if you look right at the snap, Justin Herbert is straight looking at the flat route. Both Joey Porter Jr. and Minka notice this, and they react accordingly. Joey Porter Jr. immediately is crashing down on the flat. Now, the reason why I asked if he had the cloud is if he does have the cloud here, he should be hanging back a little bit, especially seeing as Quentin Johnson's running a go. Uh, If he's responsible for the flat, then in his mind, Minka is coming over here hard because he's going to have to rotate. He's starting close to the middle of the field because they were disguising a cover two. So he really, in either case, Minka should be heading very hard to the sideline. Um, But Joey Porter crashes down. Minka has eyes on Herbert. He's looking right at Justin Herbert, who's looking at the flat. So he's not as concerned about the deep route, and he doesn't get wide as fast as he's supposed to, and that's what seems to cover that, cause that hole. So really, like, the number one thing is that Minka should be, regardless of what Joey Porter Jr. is supposed to do, 
he's got like this guy is going to become his if he's running a deep route. So Minka has got to get be able to get over there into a position to contest that throw. If Joey Porter was supposed to cover the flat, he should have hung with Johnson a little bit too before letting him go. If he was supposed to, or sorry, did I say the flat? If he was supposed to cover Cloud, he should have hung with Johnson before letting him go. If his responsibility is a flat, then everything he did here was perfectly fine. Um, he saw that the flat guy saw him looking over there and he did what he was supposed to, but Minka's eyes in the backfield is what caused a problem here. He's got to get over there and cover the sideline, cover his deep half. Herbert, to his credit, did a great job of kind of really selling that he was looking at the flat and causing this confusion, and it got Quentin Johnson wide open, and he got one of the easiest touchdowns he's ever going to get. You can see kind of the eye manipulation a little bit more from this view. The two things we want to check out or look how Herbert immediately is looking into the flat and look at how Minka is looking at Herbert. So Minka kind of gets lost looking into the backfield and it allows Johnson to go right by him and score a touchdown. So the Chargers go up seven to nothing. All right, our next play to review here is on the subsequent drive. Steelers now are down seven to nothing. And they're facing a third and four at the Chargers 32 yard line. So another kind of gotta, gotta have it play. You feel pretty good about Boswell's leg. You know, he makes long field goals in his sleep, it appears. But although Brandon Aubrey just missed a 51 yarder, so anybody's fallible. But uh, here, you know, this can make a big difference between getting seven and getting three. And the Steelers are already down seven nothing. And so they run a concept here where they're going to have Friermuth is going to run a curl. Patterson runs an out. And then Miller and Pickens run what looks like a stick concept where he's going to run here and Miller runs the out underneath. The Chargers blitz Derwin James from the slot. And so it leaves... And Asante Samuel Jr. ends up dropping off to the sticks. And the safety here ends up trying to crash down when he sees Pickens' curl. So here you you can see what Fields is going to see. So Fields takes the snap. Is already, he's looking left. So basically these routes, you know, this is third and four. This is going to be quick developing. So this is probably a moot point. He's reading from the left. So unless... There's nothing over there. He's not even going to look to his right. So he steps back to get ready to throw and look at what he sees. Derwin James has blitzed. Here comes Pickens coming up for his curl and Miller's coming out for the out. Now remember, Fields is over here on the right hash. So an out route throw to the left side, that's to the field side. That's a a long throw. Um, But if you, and I don't know how much he was able to capture, but for Fields... This guy's defender is coming in. This guy's defender is flat-footed. So when you have an arm like Fields, you can try to throw this out route, and he does. He kind of rips the out route over there, and he's able to get it over to Miller before Asante Samuel can get there. And just, you know, Samuel, in my opinion, is just, he's not in a position to really contest this throw. Like, this is where, in my opinion, you got to break down and just make the tackle. I mean, he still has him short. But fortunately for Steelers fans, he didn't do that. He tried to make a late contest on the ball that he was not going to be able to get to. And it allows Miller to break his tackle and take this for a total gain of 20 yards. But this is a good throw. And it's a good it's a good decision here because you can understand this is his guy. Right? Pickens running a curl, but he does have a defender that's like really keying in on him. And so I think that's a, it's a good... and. And I don't know that, you know, if you got Chad Pennington's arm, sorry that, you know, I didn't mean for Chad Pennington to catch a stray there, but I don't know that you're hitting this throw in time for Asante Samuel, but Justin Fields throw, you know, that gets there before Asante Samuel can, and that's a big gain. So this is where you really benefit from having a guy like Fields that has the arm that he does. This throw is available to you. He fires it in there, gets there in time, and they get a big first down on their way to scoring a touchdown and evening the game. 
So I really like the kind of decision making here, the decisiveness. You got to let it rip, right? You know, you don't have time. This is third and four. There's a blitz coming. Gets it out there. And that's a good play. A good, simple, you know, you make those simple plays, but they make the biggest difference in the world. Those kinds of things are the difference between scoring a touchdown and getting a field goal. And uh, Fields, again, acquitted himself well early in this game. All right, and here we are later in the same drive, and the Steelers now are faced with a third and three. This is another situation where, you know, makes a big difference. Touchdowns versus field goals, these clutch plays, and Steelers did well on these kinds of plays, at least early in this game. So here Fields is, has his team, and they are in 12 personnel. They've got Jalen Warren as the one running back, and they've got Washington and Fryermuth as the two tight ends. Gives you 12 personnel. And so the two wide receivers, Pickens and Austin, are down here. And they run Fryermuth in motion, seeing they've got man coverage here. Derwin James is following him. And they actually motion Fryermuth and then have him run out wide to get James. James gets completely taken out of the picture because this is just a zone read. So on the zone read, essentially your end guy is unblocked, right? So Justin Fields' job, the line, Dan Moore is going to be coming over here, and the whole line is shifting to the right. So Justin Fields' job is just read this guy. Uh, if this guy comes crashing in, then Fields holds the ball. If this guy comes and plays contain, he hands the ball off to Jalen Warren. That's the one decision on this play. So, as you see, you can see him crash in almost immediately, right? He, in fact, he, like, runs into Dan Moore's back. He almost, like, blocks himself with Dan Moore because he's crashing in so hard. Dan Moore, who's trying to block the tackle inside. So, and interestingly, like, the, the tackle feels like Fields is going to hold it. If you watch him... Watch him as he's... Because he's getting through, right? He's he's beating this block. But he whips around and tries to go that way because he seems to feel pretty certain that Fields is holding this ball. Not that he that him flipping around helps him any, but Fields correctly reads that the end is crashing in. So he's going to hold this ball. And Jalen Warren, kind of the unsung hero here, look at him, like, because this he gets so far in on Moore... Like, he crashed so hard. Jalen Warren actually turns his back, and look at him do a good job of getting in between the end and fields. He, like, throws a block with his back very well, like, artfully done, which makes it even less of a hairy situation. I mean, fields probably gets around anyway, but he doesn't even have to worry about it at all. And, I mean, Warren is strong. Like, this is a defensive end. It's not like he gets shoved into fields. He at least holds his ground enough on this interaction here that he, like, what if he got plowed into fields? That could have been really bad. But Warren held his ground and fields get in for, gets in for the touchdown. Uh, nice time to call the zone read. Very well-run play here. And it's nice to see from these kinds of plays from the all-22 view, the end zone view, so you can really see. First of all, look how Friermuth's motion brings Derwin James completely out of the picture. Like, he's over here now. Uh, Charges best defender way off there. So here is the, what you have to, if you look at Fields, he's got to decide based on what this guy's doing. This guy's clearly crashing, right? He's not hanging out here to prevent Fields from getting out there. So him coming down like this, you're not keeping that ball. And then watch Jalen, or you're not handing that ball off, sorry. Watch Jalen Warren use his back, just get in the way, make it that much easier for Fields to get in. This is just a well-executed play by the Steelers, and it's an easy walk-in touchdown. They tie the game at 7. Got a ball game going. All right, now we're now on the subsequent Chargers drive. So uh, the Chargers, this game is now 7-7. The Chargers have the ball, and they've got a third and eight at the Steelers' 10-yard line. So as you'll notice on these reviews, we do a lot of third downs because these are such impactful plays in the game and end up really determining outcome. You know, we saw two third downs the Steelers just converted on their previous drive, which led to a touchdown and uh, changed this from potentially being a 7-3 game to a 7-7 game. 
Well, now it's 7-7, and the Chargers have an opportunity here. They have completely spread things out. Uh, this looks like 11 personnel to me, the Dobbins. I think this might be Will Disley. It's kind of hard to see their numbers on the but I think this is a tight end here. Um, and three wide receivers. And the Steelers have responded. They actually look like they're in a dime package. I think Patrick Queen is the only like interior linebacker on the field. Um, all right, you know what? They're not in a dime. They've got three in here. Oh, no, this is Peyton Wilson. So, okay. They've got four linemen. They're in a nickel package. This is Peyton Wilson, who's coming and mugging. He's the guy I missed here. So they've got two linebackers. Um, and the Chargers are going to run, like, a fairly standard, like, trying to get to the sticks route combination. But the guy who you really want to look at, so see, you've got... Johnson kind of trying to work around, and this is Joe. Is that Joey Porter Jr.? Whoever that is, I think that is Joey Porter Jr. This is a great coverage right there, just working him to the sideline off the line, not giving him anywhere to go. Uh, this is actually, I don't think this is Disley. This is Hayden Hurst, who's also a tight end. He kind of just runs to the goal line, it's like to the sticks. Another good jam over here by Beanie Bishop kind of messes with Lad McConkey's route too, so there's not a lot. He's covered really tightly. But look at Semi Fahoko on the bottom here. He's going to run a post. So he's going to come up on Dante Jackson and go to the middle. And look at him right there. He's got him beat, right? He's got him turned. There's no deep safety back here. I mean, a throw here is a straight up touchdown. Right, like, if Herbert is able to, you can see Jackson is struggling. Like, if Herbert's able to put the ball here, that's a touchdown. Where is the ball? The ball goes over his head. You can see the ball right there right now. Over his head, out of the end zone, but completely offline for where he's trying to go, right? Look at him right here. He needs to be led in this direction. And look at the ball ends up pulling him way over there and still over his head. There's no chance. So that, that was a touchdown waiting to happen. Why didn't it happen? Well, we, we say his name a lot every week. But Cam Hayward, watch Cam Hayward's rush right here. Cam Hayward just absolutely rolls over through the center. Just pulls him straight back into Herbert's lap. And interferes. Herbert can't step into this throw at all. He's got pressure right in his face. And Hayward causes the inaccurate throw here. I mean, that is Cam Hayward saving four points. Uh, this should have been a touchdown. Hayward did a great job of getting right in Herbert's face, forcing the inaccurate throw. And the Chargers ended up having to settle for a field goal. So let, let's watch Hayward in just at real speed. Just watch him take the center, boom, right back into Herbert's lap. He can't make an accurate throw. And we'll get an even better view of this from the end zone camera. So here's Hayward right here. Just watch him make one step in the bull rush right into Herbert's lap. He can't make an accurate throw. That ends up forcing a fourth down, and the Chargers have to kick a field goal to go up 10-7. to seven. All right, so now we've got the next Steelers drive. They are, I think this is just after the two, two minute warning. They're down 10 to seven and they've got the ball here. They're facing a third and four on their own 36 yard line. So another third down, another big play. We saw uh, Fields convert a third and four with a nice throw to Scotty Miller on the last drive. Let's see what he's got on third and four here. So what the Steelers are going to do, again, they're going to run like a simple route combination just to try to free somebody up with the sticks. So Friermuth is running it out. Washington's running it out off of that. So this is 12 personnel, right? You've got the two tight ends. That gives you the two, the one from the one running back. It's 12 personnel. And then they're going to run a slant flat combo over here. So he's going to run a slant. He's going to go into the flat. I believe that's Austin just because of his size. That looks like that must be 19 Austin. Um, so Austin's coming to the flat. Pickens is running a slant under it. And the Chargers are running just to cover one man. So they've got a single high safety. And they end up being able to blitz one extra person just because the running back stays in to protect. 
So what they do is it looks like it's going to be him, but he actually drops off to be the robber and he blitzes. Everybody else is manned up. So man to man, man to man, man to man, man to man. So slant flat's good combination against man to man, right? You make these guys kind of have to run by each other. So let's watch the, the combination down here, the slant flat against man. The only thing you have to worry about in a slant flat combination against man if your slant guy gets open is where the robber is to make sure there's not somebody dropping in to intercept it underneath. So here they go, they run the slant and you know ideally it's possible to for the slant to be a little bit of a rub for the out route. Um, it wasn't so much in this case but Pickens runs the slant and if you notice the robber is since he was dropping like bailing from here he actually doesn't really end up being in position to affect the slant too much. But it is a little bit of a tight window throw, right? Like Samuel has good coverage. Uh, it's a bit of a tight window throw. And Fields trusts his guy. Like it's there. He's got inside of underneath Samuel. He's right at the marker. He throws this ball. And this is another really good throw from Fields. He puts it right on his hands. Samuel makes a good play to get in and knock the ball out. But, I mean, that's a good throw. Like, ideally, like the one kind of critique is that, you know, if, if Pickens were to go up with a little more of his body and just kind of box out Samuel, he's bigger, right? Um, but, and so he, he gets it up above his head, and unfortunately Samuel's able to jump and knock that down. If Pickens had gone up in the air, his body's in between Samuels in the ball. I mean, that's a lot to ask, but it's a good throw, good defensive play, and not much can be done about that. We can watch it here from the end zone view. Fields again decisive. You know, you got to get a quick throw out there. Let's see, are we going to, oh, we're not even going to be able to see it, unfortunately. But so we just got the zoomed out version over there, but. We can come back here and watch it, but that would my only like tiny critique, and I don't even know if that's a fair critique, is that if Pickens is just able to get up so that his body is in between, then Samuels can't do this. But or Samuel, I should say, Asante Samuel Jr. just makes a really good play. I don't know that one can fault Pickens' hands here. Like when someone's kind of raking in between, it's pretty rough. But another, I think, for, for Steelers fans, you know, you're not that worried about Pickens' physicality and you love the accuracy from Fields. You know, he threw a really accurate ball. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to convert and the Steelers ended up having to punt. Well, the Steelers' defense forced a punt. So even though they weren't able to convert, the Steelers weren't able to convert on third down at the two-minute warning, they got the ball back again with another chance to move it down the field. Uh, and they are now at their own 23 or so with a second and one with 44 seconds to go in the half. Uh, this was a very nice play, and it was nice not only because of the plays made, but also the plays avoided. Uh, the Steelers really did a great job on this one. Um, so what it looks like here is that the Chargers are playing like a cover three. If you want to see their like zone combination so and oftentimes when you run a cover three it's like your two outside corners have a deep third and one of your safeties takes a deep third right but this is an odder looking formation where you look the guy from the slot and the two safeties end up like taking deep zone responsibility so this is kind of a weird... Now, it's possible, right? It's possible that this is more a cover two. And this is like this guy's supposed to be kind of more coming down. So it, it's a little hard to tell. Like maybe this is a two deep shell and his responsibility is farther in, but he doesn't have anybody down there. and there, Or it's a cover three. But in either way... It's an odd way to get into it, right? It's coming from, you've got one safety and then a slot guy uh, coming back instead of your other guy who showed deep. Um, 
But what the Steelers run, which is a nice concept here, uh, they've got a curl, and then they run a corner pattern off of it. And on this side, Pickens runs the curl, and something, like my guess is, based on what happened on the right side of fields, like you see the curl with Miller here, and then you see the curl with Pickens there. Now look at the where Fryermuth is headed versus where Austin is headed. Austin is way more shallow. And I'm going to guess based on the play concept that Austin just broke this off too fast. Like I think Austin is supposed to carry this up and break more like that. But he ends up here, which I mean, there's no way Arthur Smith designed it for two receivers to be able to be covered by a guy like that. Look at the spacing that you have over here. Friar Moot's looking back, but look at where he's headed, whereas Austin's already kind of broke into the sideline. You almost wonder if Austin got so used to running his little out routes and stuff, he forgot to get the necessary depth. But if you look at when he drops back, Fields is looking to his right. right? Fields is looking over here. He's reading this side of the field first. And... First things first, you know, this is a second and one, 44 seconds to go in the half. I think Fields shows some great restraint here. There is no throw here. So look at how Fields kind of gives it one, two, three, and he's like, I don't have. He's got Miller with Samuel sitting right on top of him. Like, he's just going to drive on a throw to him, right? And as Fryermuth gets out, He's got the safety over the top, and Samuel's able to drop back if he wants to and undercut. This is actually a very tight window. I think sometimes we imagine windows as if, like, everything's stationary. Like, okay, he can throw it in this gap. But right when you throw, he's going to start dropping. He's going to start charging. Like, that's actually a very tight window. Like, the throw's just not there. So I think this was great by Fields to kind of just hang out, hang out, and continue surveying the field. Like, there is no throw there. Um, and then he comes over to his left side, right? And I should also add, like, this is a great play by the offensive line, too, to give him this much time, right? He goes back, back of his drop, looks, doesn't like it, turns it down both sides, and he still has a solid pocket to continue. You know, many times... At this point, the pocket's collapsed, and he's got to just scramble. So that's good, number one. I think the play that wasn't made is the real, like, number one highlight of this. He didn't force it. He didn't try to force it here or force it here. Either way, would have been a high risk of the ball getting picked off. Now, he comes back to the left side, which, as we've identified before, is a bit of a mess because Austin and Pickens are way too close together, my guess being that Austin just broke his corner pattern off too fast. Well, now after saying all that about Austin, I got to give him some credit here because he recognizes when he gets here, he realizes he's too close to Pickens. And so now is the time you kind of ad lib, right? And he makes the decision to come back inside, which is a very important decision for this play. He does a good job of realizing there isn't spacing and he's smart enough to be like, well, I got to make some spacing. There's no point hanging around George. So Austin cuts in, and Pickens has a very good... They worked really well in concert together here. When he came in, he dragged this defender in toward the middle. Pickens, noticing the gap, decides to work up the sideline. And this is, again, where you having a quarterback with arm talent is great. Like, he fields back here. Still in an okay pocket. He starts to realize time, internal clock's going off. He rolls to his left, and as rolling to his left as a right-handed quarterback, is able to throw this accurately down the line and complete it to Pickens for a big 27-yard gain. Pickens is able to get out of bounds. That's a really big play. So to me, the three, well, the four real components that are important in this play, one he turned down a throw that wasn't there. Huge. Two, Calvin Austin has the wherewithal to get away. Like something, he ran the wrong route, I think. And he had the wherewithal to be like, all right, let's get out of the way. Like, there's, I'm not gaining nothing here. Pickens has the wherewithal to see this guy coming in and being like, hey, I have the sideline all of a sudden. And Fields has the athletic ability to roll left and throw this on a line 
and get a 27-yard gain. That's a big play, and that's a really good sign for the Steelers' offense that, you know, one big critique so far of the Steelers' offense, and particularly of Justin Fields, is that, you know, he's not having to do a lot, right? The plays, Smith is calling a simple offense, a good offense. He's getting guys open. He's having, you know, one or two read plays. Fields is just doing what he's asked to do. Well, this is not that play at all, right? This is what he wanted to do. He looked over here, not there, not going to force it in this situation, nothing there. My left side's a mess because my receivers are too close together. Okay, they're starting to separate from each other, and you get it out here. And now we can really see the impact of Austin making that decision to come inside. So you can see Austin coming in. Look at the defender. You can see his feet, the defender coming with Austin right here. That opened a window for Pickens to go down the sideline, and that is a good throw, especially look at Fields' movement here. Going to his left, slinging that over, that's a great throw. Really good play by at least three guys on here. And then, of course, the shout-out to the offensive line because nothing happens there if they don't give time. But that's a very encouraging play for the Steelers' offense. All right, so uh, the Steelers ended up missing a field goal on that last drive we saw, so... We are now in a position where they went They went into halftime down 10-7. to 7. Now they've got the ball with that same score. And they are facing another tough spot. They're fourth, or sorry, third and 14 from the Chargers' 42-yard line. So, I mean, we love Boswell, but at this point, you know, you're kind of asking him to kick somewhere close to a 60-yard field goal, which I believe the kick he missed before half was 62 if I remember correctly. So, you know, you're asking to do a lot. And Akershire is not the easiest stadium to kick a field goal in. Um, so in many cases, especially for those who don't have a ton of faith in fields, you're thinking like, all right, let's get some yardage and make this a makeable field goal. Well, fields had other ideas. And this is where he's really starting to kind of show himself as a little bit more of a passer than just a strong arm who can do what he's told. Um, so let's see what they've got here. The Steelers are in 11 personnel. The one running back, Najee Harris, and the one tight end, Pat Fryermuth. And the Chargers are looking like what... They're going to run a somewhat complicated... They're going to run a zone blitz. And let's we'll get into the details of what they do in just a second. So the Steelers are going to have two in-cuts here. And then the deep routes are going to come on this side. They're going to have a go route. And then they're going to have Austin run a post. And what the Chargers do is they, they run a zone blitz here. So they're going to drop this guy. And then they're going to rush to three. And let's see who they blitz. They Oh, that's right. It's this guy comes down. So... It's one, two, three linemen, and then they're going to blitz one, two. And so they replace zone, zone, and then they've got this guy will drop back, and it's a cover two zone blitz. So they got a two deep shell. These guys both have deep responsibilities. The corners are playing cloud, and then you've got two underneath defenders. Um, and so this kind of the route combination on the left side kind of helps exploit that, right? We talked about earlier that one of the things, if the, especially if this corner is playing the flat, one of the areas in the cover two, you get like the whole shot over here. Well, the corner here is playing cloud coverage. He's dropped off. So the safeties usually, they each take a half. So you either want to see if you can find a gap between the corner and safety, which there isn't much because the safety is playing cloud coverage, or in between the safeties in the middle here if you don't have someone dropping. And that's exactly what Fields does. He drops back. He's got a blitz. So, you know, there's... And the, the line does a pretty good job of picking it up, but it's not like it's all smooth sailing over here. So he just doesn't have all the time in the world. He drops back. He sees the cover two, he sees the vacated area, and we, we saw this in the preseason. There was a video, uh, I'm already forgetting, I think the Steelers were playing the Colts, if I remember correctly, and they Holt Fields had a nice shot in between the safeties, 
uh, to get into the red zone. And part of the reason that one worked was because Arthur Smith had designed a really heavy play action and even pulled the guard to bring the linebackers up. There's no such thing happening here. Fields is operating out of the shotgun. The defense is blitzing, so that kind of helps because that requires, you know, a defensive end is trying to drop back and help the zone. They have no one doing, like, the middle linebacker Tampa coverage because they're blitzing. So they're low on defenders anyway in zone coverage. And so this is a great spot. Fields recognizes it, and he hits Calvin Austin right over the middle. And that ends up being a huge gain down to, like, the 17-yard line. So let's watch this in its entirety. But this is, again, really good quarterback play. He's got a blitz. He recognizes the coverage. He recognizes the weak spot. Look, we've got a route going right there. Big play for a first down. That's a 25-yard gain. Again, some just real good quarterbacking from Fields. Here you can see the blitz. They try to come from there. And look how quickly he recognizes what's going on. Like This is not like a guy who's confused by the coverage. They're blitzing. They're dropping a defensive end right here. They've got a cover two shell. Fields is ready. Boom. Fires that in there quick. First down. Big gain. That's high level quarterbacking from Justin Fields. He really is showing another level in this game. I mean, as you, those of you who've been watching my first two film reviews know that I liked what I saw from Fields. I thought the arm talent was really good. I thought the ceiling was really high. And the question was. Well, when they start expanding stuff for him, when it's not so simple, can he continue to play well? And the early returns are, yeah, it looks like it. You know, they're asking him to do more now, and he's reading coverages, and it's not just like, oh, the play won. He's fitting throws in there on third and shorts when you got to be decisive and you got to go. He's looking over at the right side at a route combination. Nothing's there. He's not pulling the trigger, throwing a bad throw. He's coming back over to the left side and creating something and creating yardage for the Steelers. And here he sees a blitz. He sees the weak part. He knows he's got a guy there. He knows where to go. He's decisive. Big gain. This is some good quarterbacking out of Justin Fields we're seeing right now. All right. Well, we've done a lot on Fields and what he's been doing in this game. I think it's only fair we do a little bit on the defense now because they also played extremely well so let's get to this play we've got the chargers in a second and 10 at their 12 yard line the steelers have kicked a field goal it's now a 10 10 game the chargers on their three previous meaningful drives totaled about 150 yards of offense so they were kind of moving the ball a little bit after they had had a couple drives with punts and then they went touchdown, field goal, punt. But even on the punt drive, they had gotten a couple first downs. Um, but here we are, second and 10 at the 12-yard line. Chargers here are coming out in 11 personnel. They've got their one running back and their one tight end. And the Steelers look to be in their nickel. They've got two linebackers right here. They got five defensive backs, two, three, four, five. Um, and so what the Steelers do here is they look like they're running a cover three. And they do a, an interesting kind of motion at the end here. See, the because initially it kind of looks like Elliot and Minka are playing too high. And... The Chargers motion their tight end over, and look at the response from the Steelers. Elliott actually comes all the way down, and Minka retreats. So it's kind of letting... The one thing that it makes it pretty certain from the Herbert's perspective is this is probably a middle-of-the-field closed coverage, right? Because Minka now is retreated as, like, the middle safety, so it's not going to be, like, a too-high... Uh, unless they try to rotate like they did on the first play that we showed you where the Chargers scored a touchdown. Um, but this is starting to look like a middle of field closed coverage and Elliott not playing that second high safety. But they really drop back and it makes you think too. The one thing is that when you have him running over, it kind of makes you think like it's probably man coverage underneath. Like if someone did this to me, I'd be like, okay, is this like cover one man? Like are they running some kind of cover one blitz with everyone coming up but actually it's a cover three zone so another really nice disguise from the Steeler so your three look like it's one two 
you got Dante Jackson dropping back too, and then you've got these guys underneath, and you have a four-man rush. So kind of a well-disguised coverage, which looks like it did confuse Herbert just a little bit. Uh, and kind of the man of the hour here is Nick Herbig, who had just come in because... Unfortunately, Alex Highsmith got hurt, and he's working on Rashawn Slater, who's one of the best tackles in the league. He's a very good tackle. And uh, Herbig, as he showed in the preseason, some of the film we broke down, he is able to corner really well. You know, Most of the time as a left tackle, when you've got somebody coming around the edge like this, and you, you from this point here, you're just trying to push them deep. Now, it is true that Herbert is in a shotgun and he does take a you know a little bit of a step back, so it's kind of a deeper target. But Herbig, look at his bend to get around right here. Uh, this reminds me of one of the other sacks from the preseason that we broke down. But he's able to get around, and it helps when you only have to go for his arm, right? You don't have to hit the quarterback's body, so you don't have to turn that much more. But he manages to get around, showing great first initial speed look at when he starts going so this ball is snapped right here and you can already see Herbig like the ball is on its way and Herbig is going so you know and the whole Steelers line gets a good jump but Herbig is moving so fast he gets to his top speed look at how much more quickly he gets going than everybody else as far as how fast he's going on his first and second steps and that helps him get around Slater who got also a pretty good get off but it was just he was so fast and then even then you know a lot of people just run themselves out of the play at this point but he's got so much bend that he's able to come back around and get to the ball it's a great play by Herbig Slater ended up falling on it, so it stayed Chargers ball, but that could have been a huge turnover. Shout out to Keanu Benton for just manhandling his guy slowly. Like that's, I mean, it's still like a good play by, I believe that's Zion Johnson on the left. It's what they call dying a slow death. That like, yeah, you're losing, but you lose slowly enough that your quarterback has enough time from your perspective. But it does get to the point where Herbert wouldn't have been able to step up much at all. Um, and also props to Larry Ogunjobi, who's taken on a double team and holding his own over there. Just another note, too, about T.J. Watt, who, is, I mean, the guy looks like he's always, you know, thinking one step ahead. Like So he's coming in, and they use the tight end to chip him. So the tight end really gets a nice jam on him. And look at what Watt sees. He sees the running back going to the flat, and so look at him, like, take a couple steps over there. Like, if Herbert had tried to bail and throw this to the running back, <laughs> that could have been very dangerous. Like, Watt might have intercepted that or just, like, gone after the running back. But it, his mind's always working. You know, I think he noticed, like, okay, I got jammed. I might not really be in it for the pass rush on this play. Sees the guy out in the flat, and he takes a couple steps in that direction before coming back over just in case if, if Herbert had made a decision to go over there it could have been real interesting and I'll see this again from the end zone view so and the Steelers are they're very prepared like look Elliot's you can see him signaling like they're showing this like it's a man coverage they're coming over and they're just going to play a zone out of it like, it, it makes you wonder, like, how would this have happened? Like, my guess is if, if this tight end doesn't move, what probably happens is Minka comes down and plays a zone here, and Elliot goes back. But since the tight end motion, they use the opportunity to make it look like a man, and they switch spots. That, that, that would be my best guess. Otherwise, like, how do you reconcile this into becoming a cover three? Anyway, you can see Herbig again. Look at how quickly he gets off the line. He's already getting past Slater's outside shoulder. Slater tries to push him around, but look at how bendy he is. He just swings, and he can, like, really turn on, you know, he only has to plant that foot a couple times. He turns on a dime, 
and gets to the ball. And you can see like Ogunjobi taking care of a double team. You can see Benton just walking his man back. Like the Steelers interior just dominated this game. And I love this here. Like even though TJ Watt got jammed very nicely by Will Disley, look at him take those couple steps out there. Like he's always always on top of things, you know. And then you almost wonder this step back was to get into that passing lane. I just feel like that man is always thinking. It's why he has like intercepted Joe Burrow a couple times from the defensive line position. Like when he's not in a rush position, he seems very aware of passing lanes. You know, I'm gonna, let me take a couple steps about that passing lane. Oh, what about this passing lane? And then Nick Herbig forces a fumble. So here it is in real time. You can see him kind of really come around and I mean it's just a really good rush and can you believe this is their third edge and he's playing at this kind of level I think the big thing for Herbig and we mentioned it on our Monday podcast this week is it's just going to be about whether he can hold up against the run like he's clearly a good pass rusher and you know for for being a good pass rusher you need a good first move which he's got he's got speed around the edge and now he's going to need to learn how to combo that because people will start setting to be ready for his speed rush around the edge. So he's got to show then that he can work off of that. All right, if you're going to overset around the edge, can I come back middle? Does he have any power at all to bull rush? Um, so we'll see what his kind of plan is coming off of that as teams get used to his ability to get around the corner and adjust for it. All right, so... The Chargers now have the ball. This is a first down, first and 10 at their own 34. So they punted after the sack we showed you at 10-10. Then the first play of the Steelers drive was that tipped interception that Justin Fields had. So the Chargers now are back with the ball and they have it on their own 34. And this play, I think, is indicative a little bit of how the Steelers just kind of won the chess match during this game. Um, This is, you know, a very Jim Harbaugh formation here. We've essentially got 13 personnel. There's one running back. There's a tight end. There's a tight end. And this is, I forget this guy's gentleman's name. Uh, They're number 44, but he plays essentially, he's a utility player. He's kind of there like, uh, Patrick Ricard uh, from the Baltimore Ravens that he kind of does some tight endy stuff, some fullback kind of stuff. I think he plays some special teams. I think he even had some defensive snaps. Like, But what they end up doing, what this is like a very, you know, so 13 personnel, this is big personnel. And look at what the Steelers are in. This is such an interesting formation. They only have three defensive backs. So Steelers counter this like big formation. A lot of times what people will do against 13 is they'll have three linebackers and four defensive linemen, and they'll have four defensive backs. Well, the Steelers come with two linebackers, three defensive backs, and they essentially have six defensive linemen. So, you know, the the edges, Herbig and Watt are essentially like you know, some people would call them outside linebackers, but, you know, they're essentially defensive line. They're pass rushers, right? And then they've got four traditional defensive linemen in here. So we've got our standard guys, Larry Ogunjobi, and let's see who is who here. I think Keanu Benton and Cameron Hayward, I think. But they also have DeMarvin Leal in here too. So I would guess, I don't know, but I would guess that part of that is having Nick Herbig here, who is a little lighter guy, so I don't know if they feel as great about him handling the run in this big formation, so maybe that's why you add an extra line. But in any case, they've got six people who would be like kind of often by most considered defensive linemen, Um, two linebackers and three DBs. Uh, And this is where someone like, Deshaun Elliott is so useful because he's a safety that's kind of essentially playing like a hybrid corner in this situation, right? You got one corner, you got a safety, and you got Elliott who's kind of being able to do whatever he's got he needs to do. 
Um, and so what the Chargers are trying to do out of this formation is they're actually trying to run a play-action shot play and get someone open deep. So they're going to run a max protect. They're going to have seven guys in to protect. So hopefully give Herbert a lot of time. And they're going to get Johnson running a corner and then the tight end here, who I think is Hurst, running an hour out. And they're going to try to get somebody open. Uh, they do end up having the running back leak out a little bit late as like a late pass option. But it starts as a play action to try to draw the Steelers in. Well, unfortunately, like I said, this is being about the chess match. The Steelers are ready to just blitz. They're coming after and just they they literally only have four guys in coverage. So they're actually just coming in with seven. So they're meeting the max protect with a just a sending the house blitz. And when you have a max protect, the negative is you only got three guys out for routes. And they have four guys to cover. And again, we've talked about spacing before. I mean, this is here, right? He, he can dump this off, which is probably the right. When you're Herbert, and the problem is that he is has his back to the defense and he's play actioning, so he does not realize how bad this is. If this were a traditional drop back, Herbert just swings this out to the flat. But he barely has any time to read anything. Look at, let's just watch Herbert through this. His back is turned. This is where he, he can, he turns and he sees the defense here. So at this point, I mean, one could argue he still should. I mean, when you turn and you're in this situation, I think you just got to throw this ball. Like, you, you don't have time to wait for this, especially we talked about spacing earlier, like, you have two on two and nobody I mean they're so close together I feel like either defender is liable you know if you try to throw this out route at this time he can drop off they're so close together um, so Herbert you know doesn't have time to look at these routes with the rush that Steelers the Steelers are putting in the only option here is there and I think one could reasonably argue you know I'm trying to give Herbert some credit because he's play actioning but you know at this point if you see this like I feel like your brain has got to go to where's JK Dobbins like I gotta get this ball out now and instead he holds it a beat and a Landon Roberts like he he wants to throw that shot you can see him rearing up to throw it and you know it eventually could have been there you know this could have been there, but, you know, you, you don't have time for that. I think when you see how muddy this is right now, you've got to just be looking for where Dobbins is and dump this off. There's literally nobody out here. In any case, like I said, this is the Steelers winning the chess match. They're thinking, all right, we're going to play action you, Max, protect, and get, get over your head. Well, we're not just going to think, because the nice thing about like a play action, let's say the Steelers weren't sending the house with a seven-man blitz. The linebackers are coming up, but they're not rushing the quarterback typically on a play action, right? They come up and then they have to bail back. Well, when you're already blitzing, the play action just gives you more time to get home. So it was just a great play call in that right situation. You wonder if the Steelers were expecting a shot play here, and that's why you call this blitz. And Landon Roberts, because look, this wasn't even like the most efficiently run blitz, right? Well, look at the wasted steps from Landon Roberts right here. He kind of comes back here, he comes over here, and then he gets going and then makes the sack, you know? It's not like it was like a clean, pretty blitz. Uh, even DeMarvin Leal, like he, because he's initially coming and running with the fullback or the, you know, in this case, I called him a tight end when we were thinking 13 personnel, but really he looks like he's Deshaun Elliott's responsibility and Elliott kind of hangs with him. And then when he realizes he's also in to protect, Elliott then bails and comes out to try to help with the covering the pass pattern. But DeMarvin Leal, even though he's running this way, doesn't look like he's ever doing anything except blitzing. He comes across the formation, but once the play starts, he's just going. But it's not like anybody like very easily or efficiently came free, right? It was just that they were doing a play action. And then when Herbert did get turned, 
I mean, you can't be looking for the shot play here. You don't have that kind of time. You literally have a free rusher. Like this, Dobbins is already coming out. Like this needs to be thrown over here. This is actually, the more I watch this, the more I feel like this is actually quite a mistake from Herbert. He was really looking for the, he was big game hunting in a situation where he should have just dumped this ball off. And to add insult to injury to Herbert, here's Cam Hayward with a really nice rush to the outside of the guard here. He beats the guard around the outside, and he ends up falling on Herbert's ankle, which Herbert already had a high ankle sprain. I don't know if this right here aggravated his ankle or anything, or whether it was the fall by Hayward, but Hayward fell on him, and this is actually the next play Herbert tried to hand it off on and was hampered and he didn't end up coming back in the game after that all right so let's watch it from this view here so again we've got six guys right all of those guys end up coming plus a Landon Roberts and again like if you're Herbert like maybe you're hoping he's dropping out but you, you know you have seven to protect so in theory seven on seven but so maybe he wasn't too worried coming through his play action but I feel like when you turn free rusher you know he actually has more time than I initially thought before I started reviewing this and then look just throw this ball right here right now like Herbert is looking there he's trying to see when his shot play is going to be free you don't have that kind of time and look you can see him gearing up to throw it meanwhile he's got a wide open running back in the flat I mean you know, this is why, you know, the, the all the people say that sacks are a quarterback stat. I mean, I don't know. I, I had come into this play thinking that this was not on Herbert at all. This was just a good play call at a good time. But really, like, he turns, he's got more than enough time to dump this ball off. He's just big game hunting. And you have to know the situation here when you've got a free rusher and, like, literally, like, who isn't losing in this case? Like, one two, three, and then Hayward, four people are either coming free or beating their defenders, and then five. So, like, and even when he turns, like, when he comes, look, he's facing forward now. He is free. He's already starting to win. Like, you don't have time. Takes a big sack and unfortunately gets injured, too. Big play by the Steelers' defense. So, as we mentioned in the last video, Herbert has gone out injured uh, after the Chargers punted. The Steelers drove down, had a long drive, and kicked a field goal. So, Steelers are up 13-10 to 10 at this point, and the Chargers have Taylor Heineke now in at quarterback. And actually, he was doing okay this first drive. They had started on their 20, and he is now in a third down, I believe, in five. Uh, at the Steelers 49 so they've got 31 yards at this point on this drive he did move the ball a little bit and uh, we won't go in like too much detail about the play design because this is really just a singular play made by a singularly impressive athlete uh, just basics you know the Chargers are an 11 personnel is one running back and I think this is our tight end um, and the Steelers are running a cover three. They've got their three guys back, so just a middle of field closed coverage. They do kind of like mug it up a little bit, but they end up dropping back and just rushing four, I believe. And honestly, yeah, so they, oh, they do end up, so Herbig drops back and they blitz. Patrick Queen blitzes. Um... And Wilson kind of showed blitz but didn't. But uh, let's be honest, like this play is just about T.J. Watt. And more than just being about T.J. Watt, it's about how incredibly fast he gets off the line. This is rookie right tackle Joe Alt, who by uh, all accounts has been very good so far this season. I mean, he hasn't had a ton of like high leverage games yet. You know, he started by they played the Raiders and then they played the Panthers. So he's been allowed to kind of ease in, but it sounds like he's going to be a very good tackle. And to go with Rashawn Slater on the left, that's going to be a great tackle combo. 
in L.A. I think uh, the big thing as far as where the Chargers were struggling most was with the interior. I think the Steelers' interior line is very good, and the Chargers' interior offensive line is not as good as their tackles. But we did see some plays earlier. We even mentioned a couple times about the help that Alt was getting because obviously blocking T.J. Watt is no joke. But here Alt is one-on-one with Watt. And let's just run it one time so you can watch Alt and Watt going at it. And Watt just absolutely beats him around the corner and crushes him. Um, And the key to this play is look at... I want you to watch two things if you can simultaneously, the ball and TJ Watt. Because the ball is what tells us you know, when the ball snaps so you can know if he's getting into the neutral zone too fast. Look at the timing here. Like He's moving right as the ball snapped. Like That is unbelievable as far as a get-off. He gets off right, and look how much... Look how far T.J. Watt has gone before Alt starts moving. There's Alt taking his first step there. T.J. Watt is already, you know, he as as Alt lands his first step, T.J. Watt is, oh man, that is because Watt pushes off here. He's really like almost into step two, and look how quick his steps are. Like he's pushing off. There's just no chance. Alt is not really able to get like a hand on him that is anywhere near redirecting him. And Watt just goes right in for the sack. I mean, man, that's really incredible. I'm going to watch this get off one more time. Like the timing is impeccable. Like he's right as the ball is moved he's going and here's where look at the relative positions when alt starts moving like he's tj watt is almost getting like equal with him already before Alt can get out to him i mean he's just got no chance with that get off and Watt with it i mean that's really what you talk about when you say like a just a superb individual effort like that is just one man making a play and completely destroying an offensive play by himself. You can see Watts over here. And just look at what Alt has to contend with. Again, the timing. And, And Queen seems to know the snap too. I mean, if you look at Benton's already going at the snap, too, I think. But what? The the difference being that he not only times it absolutely perfectly, but look at how much ground he starts covering, like, immediately. Look, what? I mean, Alt's just able to get, like, a weak right hand on him as he's going around. Like, he's just... There's no chance. That is an incredible pass rush. And just a singular performance by a singular individual to get a sack. And end a Chargers drive here. So this, remember, the Steelers are up 13-10. This is a third down play. So Steelers are going to get the ball back now in the fourth quarter with the lead. All right, now the Steelers have a second and eight right about their 45-yard line. They're up 13 to 10, and they're 702 to go in the fourth. Uh, so they did a good job of, you know, they, they've had one now post Herbert drive. After Herbert got hurt, they punted it, and, and the Chargers came. They got about 30 yards or so, and then TJ Watt had that sack, and they had to punt the ball away. So the game is still, you know, hanging in the balance here. It's just a field goal game. And the Steelers now at their own 45-yard line. And let's break this play down. So they start out in a bunch set. They're in 11 personnel. They've got the one running back, Najee Harris, and here's Pat Fryermuth over here. 
starting out in the bunch set, but then Patterson motions over, and you can see based on the way they're moving, they're at least showing zone coverage, right? The char Chargers. No one's running with him, they're kind of sliding over, so it looks like zone coverage. And at the snap, you can see them blitzing this backer. So they've got six back in coverage, and it looks like they're playing some form of like quarters coverage. So what that means is each of these four guys is responsible for a fourth of the field down the field. And I think one of the ways you can kind of tell that is everybody's kind of in their own area, just looking to see kind of what, and everybody's getting a little bit of depth. Um, and then they kind of have two underneath defenders. So typically in quarters coverage, you'd have three underneath, but they blitzed one. Um, and they didn't replace with anybody coming back. So the underneath is a little bit vulnerable. And what are the Steelers doing? So the Steelers are running kind of a similar slant flat combo, but they're running the slant like a little bit deeper. So they're, it's not like get off the line and go. Like Austin's running a little bit in and then coming in. And Pickens is coming out to at the flat. On the other side of the field, you've got Patterson is going to come out on, so he's in motion and he's going to turn this into a wheel route up the field. And Fryermuth is just coming and settling in the middle of the field here. So the first thing to note here is that, you know, they don't have that extra underneath defender, right? They blitz somebody from the middle. So there is a little bit of opening. Like, look at Fryermuth, he's. He's got a lot of space there in the middle. But the other thing that does is you don't have the underneath defender that's preventing you from throwing a slant. And you can see, like, that's where Fields is looking pretty much from the beginning. I think he's looking over to the right, and he's reading this concept. And he notices that there is quite a big window for him to make this throw into Austin. Well, you know who else recognizes it is the safety over here. And... Another reason why I feel like this is quarters coverage with everybody kind of having their quarters, he has nobody here. And so he notices the window and comes and charges down to try to make it a little harder to throw underneath. But this, I mean, for a guy with Fields' arm, like there's just too much of a window here. He notices it. This is a great throw. In, a, in a, the hole of a zone, the timing has to be perfect. It's not like Austin, and he kind of stops him a little bit with the throw, which is, again, really important. Like, look at Austin's kind of screaming through. You would hope that Austin's instinct would be to sit here. Kind of hard to say whether he would have, but in any case, Fields' throw sits him here, which is perfect. If Fields tries to lead him, he runs this throw at a risk. So this is actually a very, it's not just a good decision to throw this ball and a good arm strength to get it there, but it's also a good decision about where to place this ball. He places this ball in a way to sit Austin in between these two, and he sits him, makes the catch, and then fast enough to take it all the way by himself. So let's watch this in real time. But this is really good quarterback play. I mean, Fields, again, this is seeing what's going. So you see the, the vacated window right there, right? And we've got this big window in the middle, so when Austin comes through, there's going to be a nice path for Fields to throw this ball. But like we said, with the safety coming in, that placement was so important. You know, he didn't try to do too much. Right here, your window is closing fast. This is the NFL. So just throw it on him. Don't try to lead him into the next defender, which is exactly what he does. Throw it right on him. Austin does a good job recognizing that. He stops his route makes the catch, gets into the end zone. Again, Fields is playing really well, and we can see him read the play here uh, in real time. There's goes the motion. Look at Fields. He's reading the right side, right? He's really looking at the Pickens-Austin combo and what's going to come up in there first. Sees his window, rifles it in there, and you can see it from his view. I mean, this wasn't that... Look at him stop Austin. You see what we're talking about? Like Austin, he's not making that catch on the run, and he's not because Fields stopped him with the ball. You know, if you if the trajectory of this ball is more like this to try to 
I'll bleed him. I know he can't throw it curved like that, but I have trouble doing straight lines on a trackpad. But if he throws it like this, there's a chance that a hand can be gotten on that ball, right? But he does a great job of just stopping him with the throw. He gets it in that window perfectly. And that's a very good throw, and it's very good ball placement. That is good quarterback play from Justin Fields. All right, so now we've got the Steelers up 20-10. to 10. The Chargers are now facing a third and 14 on their 26-yard line. So they've already suffered one sack by Nick Herbig. Then they gained some of that yardage back. I think they got a six-yard gain, and they got third down. So the Steelers' defense is really just teeing off at this point. Uh, the Chargers are... They look like they are in 11 personnel. I think this is Dobbins, their running back. And then they've got one tight end. And what they are going to do to try to get down to the sticks, uh, they, you know, they're bringing in, they're keeping the tight end and Dobbins in to pass protect, although Dobbins is going to leak out late. But their concept here, they're going to run a dagger concept over here, which is on the outside, you run a dig, and the inside route is a go. And you're hoping to like clear out everybody with this route and leave a void for the in cut underneath it, the dig, to come in here. And this looks like Johnson's running either like a deep comeback or it could have been a dig. In any case, by the time he gets down here, Heineke has already been sacked, so it's kind of hard to tell what he's going to end up doing. The Steelers, uh, well, and the other thing to note really is how much attention gets paid to, to TJ Watt. They start, they have the tight end basically come out and block him to let Joe Alt come over here and set up behind. And then the tight end leaves and Alt is in position to block him. Uh, Ogunjobi over here gets doubled. And then these two run a stunt, which is to me kind of the funniest part of this play because. The point of the stunt, and when Hayward comes in, the hope is that he engages and occupies both of these blockers and Herbig can loop around and get in for the sack. <laughs> now watch what actually happens. So here it is. Herbig initially engages Dobbins here, but he's kind of waiting for this action and then going to try to loop around. So right there, and this is where Herbig releases and he's going to try to come in and make the sack. But the guard ends up kind of coming off and he handles the stunt pretty well. And watch, just watch, let me get it back a little bit. Okay, from here, just watch the tackle, Rashawn Slater. Again, one of the better tackles in the league. Watch what Hayward does to him. Just absolutely tosses him aside and gets to Heineke. Like, oh, I, we see that like, 35? This is incredible, the kind of stuff that Hayward does, like, at this age. Like, he's so powerful. Just tosses him aside. And look how strong he is. He, he gets Heineke's back with one hand and is able to arrest his motion. <laughs> he's so strong. I mean, this is really an incredible play from Hayward. He's really supposed to be like the setup man for this. You can really kind of see what it was supposed to look like from right here. You know, ideally, there's the gap. You go get the sack. But instead, the guard comes off, so then it's just Hayward and the tackle. And Hayward just absolutely destroys Rashawn Slater. That's that. And then he's so strong... Heineke, come here. <laughs> and that's it. And he sacks him. And that would be the last offensive play that the Chargers ran for the game. So let's watch this again. Here's Hayward. He's going to be kind of trying to... He's trying to get both of these guys engaged and going that way to create a hole for Herbig to come in on the stunt. So here it is. You see what it's supposed to look like. That's supposed to be the... He's supposed to be the pass rusher here. But then look at what he does to to the... Oh, you know what? That's not Slater anymore. I think Slater is already out. Is that Trey Pipkins? That might be Trey Pipkins. That might explain why he gets destroyed to that effect. Like, look at that. 
Oh my gosh. I mean, there's no chance. And then just one arm is enough to get to him. But I just, like, this is about as dominant as you can see a defensive lineman. The way he just shoves him aside and goes in for the sack. And the Steelers would then run almost five minutes off the clock. I think they got the ball with, like, just under five minutes to go. They ran the entire clock out to win this game. Just a dominating performance in the trenches. I think the interior defensive line kind of started the day. The outside, uh, the edges kind of carried in the middle and got some big sacks toward the second half. And then the offensive line just absolutely ended with an exclamation point. Just... They ran the ball all the way down the field and ended it with kneel downs from the one-yard line. Uh, a big win from Pittsburgh. A really good sign from this team as far as how they're progressing, especially on the offensive end. And that's it for the week three film reviews. Uh, apologies for getting the Steelers one out late this week. The uh, day job was a little busy, and so ended up releasing this later than I thought I would in the week. But uh, thanks for all of you that follow along, those of you that watch, those of you that listen to the podcast on wherever podcast app, that's Steeler Thoughts, Chief Feelings. Those of you that follow along on social media and engage, that's at STCF715, at STCF715 on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. And please follow along with the Twitter on game days. We try to tweet out you know, some clips and thoughts about the game during the game, but especially in the little time after the game. All right. Well, thanks again, and until next time.